at this time, I would like to um, turn it over to our program for today. And you all know our member, Ken Ackerman. Ken, if you'd like to come forward, he's going to talk to us about the magic of El Camino Santiago. Oh, Joanne's going to... Ken Ackerman is president of the Ackerman Company, which is a management advisory service in the field of logistics and warehousing. Most of us have known Ken for many, many years as, as he's been a longtime Rotarian. Um, and some of us know also that he, uh, for quite a few years, has been group chair for Vistage International, which is a world-leading chief executive organization. Well, we've all read about his uh, impressive educational and professional credentials in Rotary uh, in the bulletin this past week. So let's get on and hear what he has to say. But I do want to say that personally, I consider my friend and really sort of my travel hero. Somehow, through his business, he has managed a lifetime of world travel on the dime of his many international warehousing clients. Talk about a win-win. <laughs> But today we're going to hear from Ken on a travel subject that has nothing to do with logistics, warehousing, or chief executives. Today we're going to hear about a recent trip that Ken took and the many things he learned from that trip. But I'm going to let him introduce that trip and tell you a little bit about it right now. Ken Ackerman. Yep. I have altitude sickness. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a travel log. I'm not a travel expert. It has some photography, which is only fair because I'm not a photography expert. <clears throat> uh, what it is about is people. So let's get on with it. Uh, long after I have forgotten the things and sights of the province of Galicia in the north of Spain, I will remember the people. Most of this presentation is not about things and places, it's about people. So let's look at the people. I was lucky enough to persuade my son Robert to come along. He was essential for a couple reasons. He spent his junior year at university uh, studying in Madrid, living with a family in Madrid, and uh, getting completely acclimated to good Castilian Spanish. Both of us are fluent. Uh, he speaks good Castilian, I speak bad Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we, we looked upon this as a travel experience. Uh, you'd be surprised how many people in the Columbus area have walked the Camino, uh, including Tim Young, who did it what, last summer, right? And, and, and so if you want to know more about it, talk to Tim. Uh, but let's look at the people, the Gallegos, who live in Galicia. Those two ladies on the left won't remind you of the typical Spanish senorita with a comb in her hair and castanets dancing around with a flamenco. <laughs> If you look at those two ladies on the left, they look like they might have stepped out of an Irish cottage with a slate roof because they're Celtic. And those of you who've traveled that part of the world know that the Celtic people settled the province of Galicia together with the two to the east. Uh, they're heavy Celtic influence. Uh, these two ladies uh, run a little coffee shop along the road to Santiago, and uh, up on my shoulder there is a cork board uh, with a map of the globe. So when we walked in there to get in out of the rain, uh, they said, you need to stick a pin in that board to show where you live. My son lives in New York. They all knew where New York was. Uh, but they didn't know where Columbus was, so I stuck the pin in the cork board. Mm -hmm and came to the full realization that the Gallegos are Celtic. They're, they're not like the rest of the Mediterranean at all. And the thing that impressed me about these two ladies is I thought they would rather be 
good conversationalists than selling things. They just took an enormous interest in people, and we saw that all along the Camino. Let's talk about some other people. These two girls, about the age of my granddaughters, are from Lisbon. They're not Gallegas, they are Portuguese. And we met them, I think, about the end of the second day, and uh, they stuck with us the rest of the trip. Uh, no romance involved there. I finally f figured out, it didn't take me long to figure out what their motive was. They were calling Mama each night, who was probably scared to death that her two unmarried daughters are, are parading around this wild country of Spain. The Portuguese, I think, consider the Spanish to be barely civilized. <laughs> and and uh, I'm sure they went back and said, Mama, don't worry, because the younger of the two of them is a grandfather, which makes the older one a great-grandfather. And <laughs> so we are telling all of the folks that we're taking care of our relatives. And, and so they stuck with us the entire remainder of the trip. We, they were never in the same hotel. They were staying in the youth hostels in bunk beds. Uh, we, my son and I, did not rough it. We were in a luxury hotel uh, in each town uh, with a service that moved a suitcase to the next town so we didn't have to take anything on a backpack except uh, the essential of water, fruit, and nuts to, just to have something to eat. Uh, but uh, those two girls, uh, Christina and Madalena, were pretty bright ladies, uh, clearly well-educated. One of them uh, worked for Siemens, the German electronics giant. The other one worked for Ikeda, but not as a retail clerk, but as managing software. So they were a lot of fun to talk to, and uh, it seemed like they sought us out, even though we were never in the same hotel. We, Never got very far down the trail until the two girls were there. Uh, I would add, when we first met them at the end of a long day, they said, we, we think you need something to eat. We've got these good chocolate cookies. And I said, that sounds really very good. And opened the backpack, and I said, you got a whole grocery store in there. <laughs> well, they did. Uh, but they were, you know, they had everything on their backs, which is what the young people do on this famous hike. Uh, I would add that there are really about four Caminos. There's the famous one that Tim did part of, I think. Uh, it's 800 kilometers from the south of France over the Pyrenees and over the four provinces of northern Spain to get to Galicia. Uh, the chairman of the board of my company told me I wasn't allowed to be gone that long. Uh, that's about a six or seven week hike, depending on how athletic you are. So we took the Portuguese route that starts in Lisbon, but we took the train to the Spanish border and walked only 71 miles, six days, a fairly easy hike compared to what people do on the French route. So let's talk to some other people. Whoops. Uh, there's a whole gang of people. I think the guy in the blue shirt is the one who came from Germany. Uh, he's a doctor, an anesthesiologist, traveling with his daughter. Uh, there was a Dutch guy with his, traveling with his daughter. Those folks from northern Europe didn't know any Spanish, so they were glad to have us to talk to so they could talk English. Uh, I think it's the guy in the white shirt was in the wine business, and he had a lot of samples with him. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the... Uh, he also had a bota. Some of you may have seen the Spanish wine skin that's called a bota. It's a very efficient way to drink because it's very sanitary. You tip your head back and squirt the wine down your, down your tongue. You don't spread any germs that way. I decided that wine and hiking didn't go together, so I didn't have very much of his wine. Uh, and of course, over to the right are the two Portuguese girls and I'm not sure I can identify all the rest of them. My son in the middle, uh, hogging the camera. Uh, but see, these are just some of the folks we met, and, and you just keep meeting the same people, because they're all staying usually in the same town, 
and you sort of catch up. I'm a slow walker. I, we started early, and uh, the fast walkers uh, slept late and caught up with us. Uh, we had some wonderful advice about this, and that was to not have hotel breakfasts and not get on the road too late, to be on the road first light, uh, and to have in a backpack uh, nuts and fruit and, of course, plenty of water. And it's amazing how nourishing nuts and fruit are. They provide everything you need to keep going. And then if you want something to eat halfway along the route, you stop for coffee and pastry, something like that, which is where those two Celtic ladies were. They were doing coffee and pastry. So uh, it was a, you, you sort of tend to meet people along the route, which is what makes it fun. This is Nuria. Nuria comes from Valencia, straight across the Spanish peninsula, uh, the opposite end of the peninsula. Valencia is where Paella comes from. And uh, Nuria is a lady, I would say, in her late 50s or early 60s. She's lonesome. Uh, she wa she's a talker. Uh, about the time she gave me a blow-by-blow -blow description of her brother-in-law's funeral, I decided I'd heard enough. <laughs> from, uh, and and I, that evening, I told my son, I said, I think, I think Nuria is kind of a pain in the tail. And he said, well, I love her Spanish. I said, well, she's from Valencia. I don't, I don't know why. I don't know why you'd be surprised at the fact that she speaks good Spanish. So I said, I'll make a deal with you, Robert. You walk with her. <laughs> <laughs> but Nuria was a delightful, lonesome, lonesome lady. And like the two girls from, uh, from Lisbon, uh, Nuria was with us from the time we met her till the end of the trip. And she was a very kind an interesting person, even though she was, to me, a pain in the tail. <laughs> this is one of the more interesting people. Uh, this is Professor Freire, and pro the professor is the head of a K through six, or maybe pre-K through six school that's right along the trail. And uh, Professor Freire had an agenda he would corral people and say, I want to talk to you. Uh, he'd spent time in Chicago. He'd been in Ohio as far as Dayton to see the Air Force Museum. But he had an agenda. He said, I want to give you a little scallop shell, which is the emblem of the, uh, of the pilgrimage. And I want to give you a piece of paper with some instructions, and I need your help. There's the piece of paper with his name in the middle. And if you look at the writing on the side, on the right side, when you return to your country, please send us a picture to know where the, our pilgrim shell is now. So I thought that was a pretty neat idea. And when I got back, uh, I live in Miranova, and the balconies have a pretty good shot of the Scioto River Valley in the downtown Columbus. Got one of my neighbors to take my picture there. And I sent it back to Professor Freire with a couple of paragraphs about why Columbus was important. And the thing that's in longhand at the top was a code because he had a camera taking pictures of us. I didn't bring that picture, but it's a picture of Robert and me and two girls. Guess who? <laughs> uh, but he, I thought, he said, you know, these little kids in this school have the whole world walking past them, and they never know who that is. And he said, I want all of these kids to know what that world is. I thought that was a pretty good idea, and I was very glad to, to help the professor do that. Uh, also impressed by the fact that he spoke uh, basically Ohio English. Uh, everybody, everybody, uh, the, there were a lot of linguists in this group, and, uh, but he was exceptional and a very interesting man with a very interesting school. I mentioned that these are Celtic people. That guy in the, one of the arcades in Santiago de Compostela, which is the main town that everybody is headed for, is playing bagpipes. And the bagpipes appear to me to be identical or nearly identical to what they play in Ireland and Scotland. 
Uh, the music didn't remind you of anything you ever heard from Scotland, but the instrument was identical. He was passing the hat, of course, to collect a little money for doing it. I saw at least four pipers on this trip, and uh, they all are well acquainted with the fact that these hiking tourists are interested in what they're doing. The last group of people I want you to meet on the left are a group that's called a tuna, like tuna fish. The history of the tuna, which is sort of a college musical group, goes back to the 13th century. Started in southern Spain, spread all over Spain, and uh, Wikipedia says that a tuna is as much a fraternity as it is a musical group. Uh, the guys on the left are in these medieval costumes with a red sash. I guess each tuna has a special costume. And these guys were having one heck of a lot of fun. They were in one of the arcades of Santiago under a uh, canopy. And then the picture that's just glued onto the right there is the audience who were having at least as much fun as the mus musicians. It seemed like almost all those people in that room knew the words to all the songs. Uh, they, I was impressed by the fact that they played two Mexican songs, two ranch songs. Those were the only ones that I knew the words to. But uh, some of these uh, folks that were watching made a conga line and danced around and sang. And, and I don't know who had more fun, the musicians or the audience. And the deal with the tuna is they'll play 15 or 20 minutes, pass the hat, and then go on and play somewhere else. We encountered them really by accident on the way back from a dinner and saw a crowd gathering and enjoyed it. But I think it was typical of the kind of thing, and you don't have to go to Spain to see something like that. Uh, singing societies, you don't have to go any further than the Manor Corps in German Village, which is the singing. I don't think you had to be a German to be there, but you had to be able to sing. <laughs> and uh, you know, at a university level, uh, there's this thing called the Whiffenpoofs at Yale, and if you get two Yaleys with a couple drinks in them, they will sing the Whiffenpoof song. <laughs> I see a Yale nodding his head, and I'm not going to encourage him. <laughs> so, so the Spanish tradition of musical societies at a university level is called a tuna, and if you're traveling in Spain and lucky enough to see one, you can enjoy it. That's all I have about people, but I have a little bit of stuff about places. Uh, the wide river that separates Portugal from Spain, and we took the train to the border. We didn't start walking until we got into Spain. Uh, that big bridge is called the Eiffel Bridge. Same guy that built the, to the tower in Paris, and the bridge kind of looks like the Eiffel Tower on its side. Uh, very distinguished uh, and in unusual bridge and, and quite a big river. Uh, and that's what the trail, much of the trail looks like. Uh, I trained for this in Hocking County where I have a cabin. And trust me, there was no day in Spain that was as hard as walking around the big lake in Hideaway Hills, which is a little over seven miles in midsummer. Uh, I was more tired after those seven miles than we did 15 miles on the longest day in Spain. It was nowhere nearly as hard as hiking in Hocking County. Uh, those two emblems are the emblems that mark the trail for El Camino. And, and as I mentioned, there are about four of them because uh, once the, uh, the church and the state discovered what a good deal this was, uh, they established several routes. There's the Portuguese route coming up to Santiago from the south. There's the English route that comes from the north shore of Spain down to Santiago. And then the famous French route, which is what Tim walked on. And that's, if you walk the whole thing, that's 800 kilometers or 500 miles. Uh, the scallop shell is the symbol, and the arrow is the side. 
the first day we were crazy because we saw some arrows that had an arrowhead on both sides. I said, well, which way do we go? <laughs> and we saw other people that knew. They said, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you, you end up at the same place. And that happened because when they moved the route, probably for very good reason, uh, some angry merchant said, you're not going by my store anymore. So they put two arrowheads on it going both ways, hoping that they'd continue to go by their old store so they could sell stuff to the tourists. And while a lot of people sold stuff, I never saw anybody selling very hard. Uh, they're, they are uh, lovely people. They like to meet people, and they don't sell hard. Uh, the last of the places that I want to show you is the stone in front of the cathedral that marks the end of the trail. And everybody has to put their feet on the stone to show that they did that. Now, there's a very interesting deal here on this collaboration between church and state. Uh, when you start on the trail, they give you a thing uh, called a credential, and you're supposed to, every time you buy a cup of coffee or something, you stamp the credential, and then when you get to the cathedral, uh, if you are interested in religion, you go in and you present the credential and you get a certificate that says you did the walk. Uh, my son and I, as born-again heathens, uh, did not <laughs> keep the credential and uh, did not go in the church because there was a big long line. I'd been in the church before I knew what it, the cathedral looked like. It's a beautiful building, but I did not feel like standing in line and I didn't think I needed the certificate to prove that I made the walk. It just did not interest me. So let's talk about food. If you like seafood, you love being in Galicia. Uh, shellfish, clams, mussels, uh, oysters, uh, raw and cooked, spectacular seafood, octopus, which I also like. And we sought the advice, usually, of the locals, you know, what, what are you really pushing, what's really good? and uh, never went wrong. Uh, I have seldom had better food anywhere in my life. Uh, the drinkables are pretty good too, uh, and they don't stand on ceremony. This uh, one little eating place, uh, they didn't bother with wine glasses. They had those ceramic bowls. You just drank the wine out of the bowl. Now, my favorite wine store in German Village has the Albarino wine uh, which is the most famous wine from that region. They not only have it, they have it in two or three different brands. I usually pick the pr prettiest label, like most wine buyers. <laughs> and uh, uh, you'll find Albarino on the wine lists of many eating places in Columbus. Uh, that's the extent of what I wanted to share with you in this non-travel log, except that I would like to make a couple of recognitions. Uh, this lady on the right, would you stand up so everybody can see you? Yvonne is a, a fitness coach, and uh, she works with people in our building, and she works elsewhere in Columbus, too. And I'm probably her most ordinary client. <laughs> so when I made the deal to do this, I said, Yvonne, I want to get your attention. I said, if I don't finish this walk in good shape, it's your fault. No pressure. <laughs> uh, I also want to recognize somebody who was not here, I hoped would come. Uh, her husband and I have done business together for longer than I'd ever care to admit. And her name is Cynthia Gardner. And she did the long French route. She'd done it uh, two or three times. And she was my coach. Uh, and my inspiration. I said, if Cynthia can do this, by golly, I can too, although I'm not going to walk that far. Uh, and, and Cynthia, whose daughter is a nun, has a great religious interest in it and stops at various churches to pray, as many people do. And I think a significant number of people are on this for spiritual reasons of all kinds. Uh, but one of the great pieces, of, several pieces of advice that Cynthia gave me, 
Uh, one was, and she kept beating me over the head with this. She said, it's not a race and don't get hurt. If you fall and get hurt, you're gonna spoil the whole trip. So don't make it a race. So I was very happy to be a slow walker. I did, only got there a little later than the fast walkers. And as I said, we were never in the same hotel with the kids who were all in cheap places and we were in expensive places. Uh, and of course, I should mention that, as I did, that Tim Young, you walked the French route, right? I, I did the St. Ignatius. Which starts in Loyola and ends up... Uh, okay, the, but that's across the, the northern tier. But part of it, part of it is, on, yeah. is, on, uh, is on your trail. Yes. Oh, okay. With, with the clamshell, uh, yeah. go this uh, way. Yeah. So uh, you'd be surprised how many people have done this. A uh, couple of sentences about history, because clearly a funeral director with even more imagination than Mike Schettinger moved the remains of St. James from the Middle East to the northern coast of Spain, which had to be a logistical triumph. And uh, the Spanish people said, that's such a nice idea, we'll build a cathedral and, and find this town, Santiago, literally means St. James. Uh, and somewhere along their line, somebody got the idea that we had to have this pilgrimage to get to Santiago. That dates back to the 12th century, about a century before the Tunas and it's all part of a very long tradition. That's really all I have to say about it, except I'd be happy to answer questions if there are any. Thank you. Mike? Well, thank you for the plug for the funeral industry. <laughs> well, first of all, tell me how old you are. Well, that's a military secret, but I celebrated a 90th birthday last February. It's even more impressive what you accomplished, uh, for sure. Um, can you real quickly talk, there's multiple trails and trips. How many are there? Because um, the one that we looked at was in Portugal, yeah. and I heard you say France and Spain. How many different choices are there? The original traditional route, Mike, started in the south of France, went over the Pyrenees down to Pamplona, and then across through the Basque land. Uh, uh, Cantabria is the next, and then uh, Asturias, and then it's 800 kilometers. And that is the one that's most publicized. There's a movie called The Way, and that's all about the French route. And that's the one that's most celebrated. Uh, I wasn't, as I said, I wasn't about to spend the kind of time it would take to walk. I think I could do it, but I don't want to spend the time. <laughs> so I walked, uh, the, then the, the, route, the Portuguese route technically starts in Lisbon, but we said we're just going to do the, the 71 miles from the Spanish border up to Santiago. The English route starts at the north coast and go straight south to Santiago. Yeah. Uh, tell people how you get to this club from Maranova usually. Oh, well, I walk in nice weather. <laughs> but only if it's nice. I didn't feel like walking today. <laughs> yes, Millie? Yes. What kind of weather did you have? Glorious. First week of October. My friend Cynthia had done it in midsummer when it can be brutal. And Cynthia had said, one of her very important pieces of advice was, you get on that trail at the very first light, don't fool around with hotel breakfasts because they're slow and they're too big. Uh, eat just a little bit of stuff or have it in your backpack. Don't eat anything like a breakfast until mid-morning. Now, one of the things that happens is Spain, the whole country of Spain is on European time even though Santiago is west of Dublin and should be on British time. Portugal's on British time, but Spain's on. So it didn't get light in October until almost 8 o'clock. So we, we couldn't get out early unless we wanted to walk in the dark, which we didn't want to do. Yes? 
Yes, I, I just wanted to tell you how much I enjoyed this, and I, I know everybody did as well. And I had the good fortune to be in Porto, one of the areas that you alluded to and, and Scott mentioned in the article, and I went uh, up and saw the pilgrimage up by Fatima, but I had no idea that this existed until I heard that you were going to talk and Scott sent that nice intro. So I spent about two to three hours last night, I was just sucked into this, and what a gorgeous part of the world and what an experience and that whole area. You spent so much time on people, which was fascinating, but, but the uh, countryside and the coastline is extraordinary. And I well, Fatima is very special and, and somewhat distinct from, uh, from the Camino, but, uh, uh, but very much part of Portuguese sightseeing. Yes. What prompted you to do this initially, and did you meet any Rotarians along the way? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't find any. Uh, no, my inspiration was Cynthia Gardner, and, and Cynthia is a very old friend, and I said, boy, Cynthia doesn't look like an athlete to me. And uh, if Cynthia can do this, by golly, I can too. I took the gardeners to dinner and looked at their slides, and I said, you know, I think I can do this. <laughs> but uh, but I'd be darned if I'm going to try 800 kilometers. I just can't take that much time. Yes, ma'am. So this is a big inspiration. This is on my has been on my bucket list for a long time. So okay. this gets me really excited. Did you use a company to help book all your um, your stays, or did you do it yourself? Uh, I'm a member of the German Village Walking Club. We walk every Saturday morning, uh, meet in the statue of Schiller, and. Uh, one of the people in that club has a cousin in Akron who's in the tour business. Big discussion with Cynthia. Cynthia does it without tours. Uh, Cynthia owns a house in northern Spain, and they, they very comfortable there. So she gets on the phone every morning and makes a reservation on her cell phone. After a lot of discussion, we decided we didn't want the risk of not finding a hotel room. So with my friend from the walking club, we found a tour operator and uh, an operator who specialized on the Portuguese route. So it wasn't really a tour, it was a prearranged thing for just two people. We convinced them that we didn't need any hand-holding, we knew the language, uh, but what we did, did want is when we got to a town, we wanted to know where we're gonna stay and we didn't feel like carrying a big backpack. Yeah, it's called uh, Costa, but I can get it for you. Yes. How far did you walk each day, and how long did the whole trip take? take? Longest walk was uh, 15 miles. That was the longest one. That was the last one. Uh, the shortest one was about eight or nine. Uh, and they varied. You'd have a long day and a short day. One of the other wonderful pieces of advice that we got and followed is the most important part of your gear is socks that better be a heck of a lot better than the cotton socks you might wear to work. Heavy wool hiking socks. And when you get to destination, boots and socks come off and you get into your bare feet and sandals. Your feet say thank you, thank you. <laughs> Yes. Is, is most of the trail rural? Is it wilderness? Or is there some urban? It's not wilderness. And I would add there's a website uh, for the Camino that gives you every detail. On the route we were on, there was some kind of a little village or town about every two or three miles up the road. And, uh, and most of the trail was very easy walking. Uh, there were a couple of places where it was steep and a little scary, but it was only, you know, a few hundred yards. Uh, and the, one of the things we joked about and, and talked about, too, is that if you really get tired, you can probably find some guy in a car who would give you a lift to your next stop. And, and I don't know how the authorities prevent you from cheating that way. Uh, my son admitted at the end that he was all prepared to call for a car, and I said, well, maybe for you, not for me. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. I'll only find that thing that I kicked out. Okay.
Thank you, Ken. That was amazing. Thank you. Let's go ahead and give Ken another round of applause. Thank you for doing that. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you next week.